Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the second annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. Whether you're just joining in or listened to our session at 9 a.m. or sessions yesterday, we're glad you're here today. I'm Jamie Machik from the Nicolay Federated Library System in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So my system, Nicolay, and 13 others in Wisconsin are bringing you this conference virtually. It's a service we're providing, and we do hope you enjoy it. So our next presenter is Claire Moore, and Claire is going to be talking about tech services for target audience, and she is the head of children's services at the Darien Library in Darien, Connecticut. So Claire, whenever you are ready. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Jamie mentioned, my name is Claire Moore, and I'm currently the head of children's services at Darien Library. And today I'm going to be discussing Darien Library's tech series, uh, which is put on each year and actually facilitated by the Children's Department. And as the Children's Department, we are not only targeting kids, but we're also targeting entire families within the community. And in fact, the series is called The Digital Family. And this year, it's our fourth year in running the program. So just to let you know a little bit of what I'm going to do today, I'm going to first tell you about our library in Darien, uh, and also highlight some of the programs within the series. Then I'll discuss some new initiatives that are going on within the children's library, and also highlight some goals and best practices that we have determined over the years. And I'll finish up with some resources and suggestions as to how you can implement tech programs uh, at your locations. So just to give you a snapshot of the library, uh, we're located in Fairfield County, Connecticut, and Darien is pretty much a commuter town. So we have a lot of working families who are commuting to New York City to go to work. Um, it's a very busy place. And at one point, Darien uh, was actually noted for having one of the highest concentrations of families for a town of its size in the US. Uh, so in the Children's Library, we see a lot of families, um, a lot of kids, uh, also a lot of caregivers. And just to show you a little bit about how our staff um, is organized, currently we have three full-time librarians and one library fellow who works in the children's department and essentially functions as a full-time librarian. And just to give you also a sense of our programs, um, at our busiest time of year, which is when we offer our registered programs um, and story times, we can average between 20 to 25 per week. And that includes 16 story times. Uh, so it can be a very, very busy place. Um, so all this to say, just that each library, I understand, has diverse needs and serves a different area of the country. Uh, so hopefully this presentation will give you a little bit of inspiration as to how um, you can implement these programs and services uh, to fulfill the needs of your community. So in 2009, we actually moved into a new building. So that's the building that you see in the picture. Um, and the Children's Library wanted to make a concerted effort to not only provide programming for kids uh, from birth to 12 years of age, but to also really offer programs and services to both parents and caregivers. So one of the ways we started off doing this was through our early literacy initiative. And we wanted to make a conscious decision to educate parents on the early literacy practices and skills. At the time, it was six skills. Now it's five practices. And these are um, skills that their children will need in order for learning how to read in the future. We also work with other town organizations and continue to do so. We offer workshops and programs, events on topical issues, anything from discipline to nutrition. Uh, each year we also offer a birds and bees workshop, which is highly popular. And uh, sometimes we even have to offer two sessions uh, for parents. And in addition to that, we also offer a monthly book group for tween parents that's facilitated uh, by a professional therapist. 
Uh, so that just gives you a sense of some of the programs that we offer for parents. And while we were, you know, becoming familiar with our new building and the community, uh, we got to know a lot of families and um, got to know a lot of the parents. And one of the conversations that was coming up uh, was as we were introducing technology and new technologies into the children's room, uh, parents were communicating to us that they weren't comfortable using this technology. Uh, so more specifically, we had a lot of moms, stay-at-home moms, who had been out of the workforce for several years. And they were thinking about, uh, as their children got older and went to elementary school, that they wanted to uh, start developing skills um, and start building their resume so that they would be ready to start their job search. Uh, so we really felt that if we, as the library, expose them to new technologies, that it would also help them as well as help prepare their children for the 21st century. And this phrase is usually what we communicate to parents, even in story time, that they're essentially their child's first teacher. Uh, so their children are going to look to them to model for them, whether that's in a music and movement class or also life skills such as how to deal with conflict, uh, really their children are looking to them. So for parents, we felt that the more resources and opportunities to learn that we could offer them, the greater they would benefit their children. So at the time, we were doing as to how we were going to um, implement technology, not only in the room, uh, but also in programs. Uh, there was a lot of heavy discussion as to the role of technology in a child's life. Uh, so we set out to find the root for research um, before we began our discussions and before we made our decision. So we found that, in fact, educators were saying that it was becoming important for children to have this exposure, even at a young age. I was just attending a kindergarten readiness program at our local uh, town hall, and it was put on by the YWCA. And uh, people from the board of that were there, and they mentioned that teachers were becoming concerned because a lot of the kids that were entering kindergarten uh, didn't know how to use a mouse. And this was a concern because, at least in our district, uh, they're moving more towards online testing. So this is something we're trying to express to parents, that there are certain skills, uh, even in technology, that their children have to know before entering into kindergarten. And also as libraries, uh, since many multiple types of literacies now that need to be cultivated, uh, we as librarians have the potential to make the library uh, the main space where the support can take place. So how we responded. Uh, well, when we moved into the new building in 2009, uh, we actually had a Microsoft service table that the directors of the library decided to put in the children's library. And we, after having that, in, um, it was probably one of the go-to places when uh, people, patrons would visit the library for the first time, when librarians would come from around the country to take tours. Uh, we had the Microsoft Surface for about three years, and we were trying to see what new technologies, and it was around the time um, that iPads were coming out, and we really wanted something that had a little bit more longevity, uh, and that was also a little easier to use for younger children, and something that was a little more cost efficient to manage, especially uh, as children's librarians. So we decided to mount our first iPad uh, in the children's library. And it's actually in the F5 section of our library where our picture books are located as well as our learn to read books. And because we had this focus on early literacy, what we wanted to do is curate a couple of apps uh, that kind of fit in within the early literacy skills and practices. Uh, so for example, for letter knowledge, we selected uh, letter applications uh, that taught kids the sound of the letters, uh, how to trace letters, also numbers. For phonological awareness, for instance, uh, we looked at rhyming apps, apps that focused on mother goose rhymes, uh, and also ebook apps that kind of reinforce uh, the mechanics of how a book 
um, is used, how to turn the page, um, how to read a book from start to finish. And because we were getting so many inquiries from parents, we just started putting signs on top of the iPads just to kind of communicate what apps we selected, also how they fit into the early literacy skills, um, and any information that a parent or grown-up might want to know uh, about the application and why we decided to select that specific one. So after the iPad was mounted, uh, we were still figuring out the most appropriate way for us to circulate iPads, uh, and specifically within the children's library. And just naturally, it came, um, became a topic of discussion as to, you know, let's take this early literacy focus and let's actually make it a kit, not just with the iPad, but also with some resources um, and materials that parents can use to select their own apps. Uh, so that's just an image of our early literacy iPad kit, and you'll see uh, the actual iPad um, as well as the case, and we include a charger. And then within the kit, we typically offer um, just a listing of all the apps that have been selected and also resources for parents um, as to what makes a good early literacy app and also some uh, just websites and they can go to purchase their own apps. Claire? So we're still circulating the early literacy? Yep. How long do you check that out? How long do you let them, let them check that out? I'm just curious. Uh, so they get it for one week. Okay. Thank you. And what is a gumdrop case? <laughs> a gumdrop case is the, is the type of case. So first we started out with something that wasn't as uh, kind of against secure. So okay. over time, uh, we just kind of just, you know, we have changed the types of cases. Um, we've only had in about one and a half years or two years, we've only had uh, one damaged iPad. So which is oh, pretty great. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Thank so you. Just the type of case, that's the original case. Uh, now so we have something similar, but that's a little more secure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And also just uh, something of note, all the circulation, so we currently circulate six of them. And all the circulation and updates, we get a lot of questions about this, are done within the children's library. So the children's staff actually takes the iPads back, uh, checks them out, puts them on hold. Uh, each, each return, we actually restore the iPad to its original settings. And we maintain it ourselves. And it's pretty manageable, uh, as far as we can tell. We're only circulating six right now. There have been discussions as to increase it, especially since currently, I just checked this morning, we have about 33 holds on the iPad kits. So it still continues to be a very popular app. Sorry, I think that's an ambulance going by. <laughs> um, so moving from some of the services and offerings, uh, another avenue that we used to expose patrons to technology within the children's library uh, was through programs. And the easiest way to begin for us was simply through uh, integrating them into our story times. So for starters, what we did, we just simply used a Keynote app to project the story time on the walls, uh, which seemed pretty simple. Um, but we continue to do so today. Uh, it's a great tool for classroom management and also engaging grown-up participation specifically, uh, which are two challenging aspects of, of conducting story times for librarians, especially new uh, children's librarians. And Claire? So whether it's a large group. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just had several questions come in, if you wouldn't mind um, answering some of them oh, sure. while we're talking about the iPad. Um, so <laughs> um, do parents find some kind of relief if they break it, and then how do you handle it if the iPad is damaged? So they do sign something. They do not provide a credit card because uh, we have all their information. Uh, in the language, it does say that just based on, depending on, on when, it was damaged. Uh, it's kind of something for us to determine. So we don't we don't say because the cost of 
the original pet was 600 that you, you would have to pay 600. Uh, okay. We can determine based on the damages. Uh, and just also, a lot of times we can buy um, second generation iPads, so they're not as expensive. Okay. Okay. And are you willing to share your app list? And maybe you're going to share that at the end, or, but someone asked about that also. Yes, definitely. It's also on our website, too. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So whether in a large group like our Toddler Tales program, which can get up to about over, well over 100 participants, or in a smaller environment like our Libro Sequentes program, which is our uh, Spanish language story time. It seemed that over time, adding technology to these programs uh, seemed to enhance them. Uh, so it was very, very popular both with the kids and with grown-ups. Uh, it really made it more of a hands-on experience, as you can see here. This is uh, Libro Sequentes. Uh, so in addition to uh, reading books, singing songs, uh, I was able to use some apps that really kind of uh, further drove home the vocab that we were using um, and the, that the kids were learning. So I think there, that's the Bunny Fun app, uh, which is the head and shoulders, knees and toes program uh, that uses Rosemary Wells characters to um, just point to the different parts of the body and uh, have kids learn the different terms and, and um, words for them in other languages. And in addition to that, we've also used uh, ebook apps and actual ebooks within story times, uh, especially with larger crowds. So at Darien Library, we found that offering programs within a series uh, seems to really work for our community. Um, it not only gains patron interest, but it also increases attendance. And what we've done over time, um, each, each fall we offer a fall into art series. Uh, so we offer arts programs for kids, as well as that's when we have a lot of illustrators come into the library. And we've also hosted a series um, on health and wellness, financial literacy. Each year we also do our One Book, One Community program. So after one year in the new space, uh, in 2010, we offered our first tech series for families. And this presentation is actually perfect timing uh, because we are in the midst of our tech series this year. Uh, and again, it's called The Digital Family. And our website below, um, you can go online if you wanted to see just an example of some of the programs that we're doing, both for kids and parents. Um, a lot of times each year we'll do similar programs, uh, but there are a lot of new ones this year which we're pretty excited about, which I'll talk about. Um, further on when we get into the age groups. So goals, uh, what we're looking to achieve by offering these programs. Uh, well, we definitely hope to provide exposure. Uh, so offering tech programs by a variety of ages uh, is really our focus. Uh, so not only preschoolers, but up through to adults, and as I mentioned, um, caregivers as well. So in many cases, the same way we evaluate our other programs, uh, kind of looking to make sure that we're hitting all the age groups. Uh, I usually always say that in the past, what we've noticed is uh, in all sorts of programming with children's library, a lot of times that six to eight range uh, seems to be missed because um, we're a lot of libraries are focusing on the preschool age group. Um, as well as between age group and teens, and sometimes the six to eight kind of get, um, they kind of fall at the wayside. Uh, so we really want to make sure that we have something for everyone. Claire? Yeah. With the iPads, have you had any trouble with them not being returned back to the library? Uh, no, we haven't. Excellent. Not <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you. Also educating. Uh, so not only do we want to expose uh, our patrons to these new technologies, but we also wanted to give them opportunities to learn how to use them. Uh, so how we do that, we, within the tech series and also throughout the year, we often have staff led workshops for parents. Uh, so this can be workshops on photo sharing, uh, workshops on online security, uh, how to use Facebook, 
And just recently this week, we had a family tech night. Uh, so that's kind of where we invite families in uh, to bring their e-devices, and we can kind of show them how to set them up. Uh, also how to uh, check out books within the library and put them on their devices. And also kind of highlight some of the other services we offer now. Uh, we just signed on to Hoopla, which is how patrons can view uh, films, TV. Um, they can also download uh, audio as well as music. Uh, so just kind of highlighting some of the things we have within the collection um, and also showing them how to use some of the uh, tech stuff that they might have gotten for the holidays. Did you say that was um, Hoopla? Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A. Thank you. Also engaging them, uh, allowing them the freedom to use the technology, especially kids, uh, in kind of a way that suits their needs and how they feel comfortable with, uh, which is ultimately going to empower the child. Um, and we definitely want it to be enjoyable. So just one success story that I often like to say in terms of enjoyment, uh, we had a video makers club this past year. And one of the parents came in, and we, and we knew the family. Uh, so the mom came in and said that she had signed her daughter up for it, but she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to attend because she had a lot of sports commitments. And so she was able to attend and kind of dove right in, even though she had, had no experience, uh, just using the GoPro cameras as well as the iPads. Uh, just to, and she really kind of took to um, stop motion animation app that we use frequently. And the mom had communicated that she had found her late at night in her room just kind of using, <laughs> using their own iPad and setting up these little scenes. And it was something that she had never really uh, knew that her daughter had any interest in, in filming or technology. Uh, so kind of that's something that kind of makes us smile, that it just gives kids an opportunity to find um, what they like and kind of develop their own identities in a way. So I'll start off with highlighting some of the programs that we offer within the tech series. Um, our first computer program for kids, uh, especially in the preschool age group, was Little Clickers. Uh, and this is uh, kind of an intro technology class for kids ages three to five. Uh, just to teach them about the various parts of the computer, how to use a computer, um, and introduce them to some other forms of, of technology, especially touch screens with the iPad. And this is a breakdown of some of the weeks. Um, sometimes we might offer it for five weeks, most of the time six weeks. Uh, but within the Little Clickers program, kids will learn how to use a keyboard or begin starting to kind of become familiar with a keyboard. Um, a lot of times they come in learning how to use a mouse, um, especially uh, with being able to play games. We see a lot of our preschoolers already knowing kind of how, how to navigate games online. Uh, but once they start learning their alphabet, we really want to show them uh, how to use a keyboard. And so we just have little letter activities for them to do um, to type out various things. And we also like to teach them how to um, kind of hone their motor skills. Uh, so we teach little exercises on how to click, uh, drag, and drop, and also a really funny one um, where we teach them what minimizing and maximizing <laughs> means uh, by having them jump up and lay on the ground, uh, which is really cute. Claire? Yeah? How often do does this group meet each week? Oh, so this is this is something that would be offered within the tech series. They would only meet once per week. Okay, and then how long is the whole tech series? The tech series itself usually lasts two months. Okay. But something like a little clickers class could could only last a little over a month, or it could go the full six weeks. So it just it just depends on on what else we have going on. So you can really kind of model and, and change it the way, however you know, however much time you have, however much staff you have to lead it. Um, it's also a program that we do, it's actually with caregiver, so not okay. only are we educating the kids, adult is right beside them, kind of helping them, um, and we also give them uh, information on how to kind of further. Okay, and a, a follow-up question was how long is, is each session? 
just half an hour, like our story times. Half an hour, great. I'm yeah. sorry I'm interrupting, but I feel like these questions are timely, so you'd probably want to answer them as you're talking about them. So I hope that's oh, yeah, okay. Sure. No, I <laughs> don't mind at all. Please okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the program is with adults, uh, so the adult is present, and kind of we give guidance to the adult on how to reinforce at home. And over the past few years, we have actually upped the ages, to be honest. Uh, we felt that the threes were still kind of having a little difficulty with some of the tasks, even if their grown-up was with them. Uh, so most recently, we've changed the age group to four to five-year-olds, uh, and really the time of year. So, so right now, during this tech series, we're not offering little clickers. Um, but what we are going to do is I attended the kindergarten readiness program. What we thought was, you know, what me, might, might, uh, might be a great time of year to offer it is actually in August, right before the start of school. So we can really target the four to five year olds, kids who are uh, about to enter into kindergarten and really kind of need to focus and develop these skills. Another program which I'm just going to talk about really briefly, I don't have a slide for it, is something that uh, kind of grew out of little clickers and it's text explorers. Uh, so it's for that six to eight year old range, um, the one that I said gets left out a lot. So kind of taking a lot of what is learned in the book clickers and kind of further developing it and allowing kids who are a little older um, to kind of really learn uh, more in depth about the computer and how to use it, uh, how to use various programs like Microsoft Word uh, and just things like Publisher that they may need to learn um, for school. So iKids is our tween program, uh, and it's mostly creation-based, and it's something that started uh, pretty much right when we opened the new building. So honestly, it's probably our first tech program that we ever did for kids. Uh, and at the time, all we had was what we called a creation station, which is sort of like a little briefcase uh, that we held in the back, and any time a child wanted to use it, uh, we would give it to them. And inside, uh, there was an Apple laptop, um, as well as a podcasting tool, a digital camera, and also a little flip cam. So that's pretty much what we had to work with our first uh, session of iKids. And what pretty much happened each, each week, uh, so a lot of times iKids, similar to little clickers, will run for uh, six weeks. Um, or in many cases, it, depending on our schedule, it could go to five weeks or four weeks. Uh, so currently, since we've acquired um, iPads for programming use, we are able to use the iPads for iKids. Uh, so pretty much it's moved towards um, using the programming iPads uh, for creation-based activities. And for programs like iKids and Little Clickers, we do have to limit the size of the program. Um, and for us, that has never been too much of a struggle. We usually have to have a wait list. Um, and depending on how, if, if the first year I think we offered uh, little clickers multiple times. Um, so for little clickers, we kind of moved it more into the story time uh, series time frame so that we could offer two per season, just to give you an idea. So it really depends on your programming schedule. Claire? Yep. Are most of, uh, do you have other um, Macs in your library? Also, as far as public computers, or are most of them um, HP? Uh, they're, they're all pretty much HP in the children's library. We have one uh, that we use, we, we now use for programs. Uh, it used to be our own uh, in the office, but we decided <laughs> that we didn't really, really need to use it as much as, as the kids. Um, but in the team room, that's where they have most of the Apple computers. OK. Thank you. Sure. So th this is just a little um, example of some of the projects that we've done in iKids over the years. Um, mostly when we were using the PCs and um, everything was pretty much web-based. Anytime I did it, I kind of like to take to make it more of a creation-based uh, program. So I would have them go on websites, um, a lot of museum websites, uh, to kind of create their own artwork. I think this is Artisan Cam, which is a UK website, uh, which 
highlights different contemporary artists and has uh, different activities and games that kids can play. So they're creating on top uh, their own portraits based on uh, an English artist. And also right below, one of my favorite classes was we went on the Tate Modern website and kind of were able to um, make street art based on the banks they exhibit that they were doing at the Tate at the time. Uh, we've also had Scratch classes where we introduce kids uh, to how to use Scratch. There are a lot of lesson plans on the Scratch website, uh, which is pretty much what we used uh, just to facilitate the class. Um, and a lot of the kids have really taken a lot of what we've done in the classes and developed their own interests and kind of uh, this one boy, Quinn, who, who frequently comes to our classes, uh, really loved using Scratch and, and actually ended up helping us <laughs> in teaching some of the other classes. Uh, so any opportunity we can uh, find to have some of the kids mentor up kids, we, we usually use it. So this is a class that I did uh, this past fall uh, within our art series, and I called it Art Appreciation. Uh, so again, for that tween age group, and a lot of creation-based uh, work that we were doing on the iPads. Uh, and after each session, we would sit around and discuss each of this work. Um, and each week, I kind of focused on a different type of um, art medium. So one week, it's photography. The next week, it could be I tried a music session uh, this, past, this past fall. It seemed to work really well. Um, also, we work on animation. Um, as well as just visual art, storytelling, things like that. So just to kind of give you a sense of some of the projects, uh, this is the photo week. Um, so just using two apps, and a lot of times we just do a lot of our research online um, or just via other libraries and librarians, uh, things that we might notice even our adult friends using. Uh, a lot of times it can fit perfectly in with kids. Uh, so this is during our photography session. Typically we have the kids either working in groups or working individually depending on how many kids are in the class. Um, they just kind of go off within the library. It's a great program to do in the summertime because you can kind of go outside with a group and just have them explore their surroundings uh, and just take pictures of what's going on. So this is our animation session. Um, and actually, just as I mentioned, so this, this app I actually found out about from my roommate, who's a visual artist. And he was actually using this because um, he was starting to do a lot more animation in his job and just suggested it, that it would be something that I tried with the kids. Um, so within our sessions, we just kind of work on little projects. Uh, and then through these classes, what you can really see is a lot of their case developing. So some of the kids may just be joking around and working together, which is totally fine. Um, but some of them, especially the uh, child who, who produced this animation, um, really spent the whole time kind of going off by herself and really focusing on the project and what she was doing, which is really amazing to just kind of see them uh, really enjoying their time and kind of being able to produce something, especially so quickly. It's really impressive. So our stop motion project class, uh, that actually grew out of iKids. So a lot of times we'll take something that we might try. Um, and because iKids can typically be between 45 minutes to an hour um, per session, sometimes we really don't get to uh, devote a lot of time or we might not uh, finish as much as the projects that we'd like. Um, so some things we kind of take and build on. Uh, so last tech series, so last year, we just tried, we did a two hour stop motion project. So the first hour I just had them kind of becoming familiar with the technology and with the app, keeping the candy, um, just giving them kind of little um, exercises to do, whether it's with army men or with letters. And then at the very end, the last class, they sort of started to design their own scenes and using uh, Lego sets to build So something that's new, one of the new initiatives um, and things we're really excited about is this past fall, uh, we unveiled the tea room in the library, in the children's library. Um, 
and we really wanted to give kids their own space to kind of create. Um, and we were really targeting tweens uh, at the time because we do have a kids advisory board in the library and for years they had been saying that they really wanted their own space. Um, they felt that the preschoolers um, and younger kids had an area at the library that was really their own as well as the, the teens downstairs. They have a teen room. Um, so they felt like there wasn't much of a space within the children's library for them to, to spend time and to hang out. Um, and in the past year, just thinking about how STEM programming has increased in libraries, um, as well as the presence of maker spaces, we kind of wanted to have our own maker space uh, for kids in the children's library. So the TNT room stands for Technology, Engineering, and Arts. And since we already had a digital media lab uh, for adults in the lower level of Darien Library, um, kids began to express interest in some of the technology, so especially the 3D printer. Uh, they really wanted to go in and use the area, but unfortunately they, they couldn't. Um, so it kind of really made us think, you know, we really need to, to do this. Uh, so what we decided to do is repurpose our computer lab um, and kind of move all the computers that we had used in our tech programs, bring them out in the common areas, and start to use that, that space. Um, as the tea room. So these are just some of the new program, programs that we've been offering um, to coincide with the opening of the tea room. So along the lines of technology, uh, we've tried to offer uh, programs like podcasting, uh, light painting is something we did recently, um, 3D cookie cutters to use with the, the MakerBot, um, so just trying to, to kind of find ways to um, take technologies and, and have them available and accessible for kids. So this is kind of what the tea room looks like. Um, so as you can see in the photo, uh, that's the iMac that I was talking about, what we had in the, in the office, and we decided to just move it into the tea room because it really, the only time we were really using it was to edit things or to use it for iTunes. Um, to kind of just manage our, our, our music that we were using. Uh, so we can still do that uh, in the tea room, but it just seemed to make more sense to make it available uh, for the kids. So the tea room is specifically for kids in ages, uh, grades, I'm sorry, uh, three to six. And what we do is we offer tea room programs twice a week. And in addition to the tea room programs that we offer, uh, kids are also able to reserve the space. Uh, they need to have a grown-up with them, and they're able to reserve it for up to one hour several days a week. And in addition to that, uh, we have a Maker Scout program, so we're actually keeping track of the points that kids earn um, and how they can earn point, points as they can make reservations or by participating in the programs and also by assisting the librarians with the program. So, um, as you can see in that photo, that's one of the open tea rooms where we just kind of, it's sort of like a little open house. Um, one of the older girls who is in our kids' advisory board uh, to the right, she's actually helping us uh, manage the program. So moving on to programs for parents and caregivers. Um, as I said, that in addition to targeting kids, we also uh, wanted to provide um, as many programs as possible for parents. And since 2010, our largest program uh, within the tech series is the 21 Things for 21st Century Parents program. And we've really attempted over the years to make it as doable as possible, uh, both for parents and caregivers. Uh, so a lot of times we've incorporated program attendance um, and their communication and feedback uh, to them earning points within the THINGS program. So just to give you a little background, uh, the program is based on the 23 THINGS program uh, that was created by Helen Blowers of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library that was uh, specifically designed for uh, more staff and, and librarians um, to have them develop and be exposed to new technologies. Uh, so what we wanted to do is um, kind of take use that as inspiration um, and make a 20, 21 things program for parents. Um, so it's very much self-directed. 
Uh, they have, at first, the first year it was 12 weeks long. Um, in recent years, it's, it's moved more to eight week, uh, just so parents and caregivers are able to uh, complete the program. And so it's self-directed, so they really can uh, complete all the things and kind of move through the program uh, at their own turn. A lot of actually working parents can't attend all the programs that we might have during the day. Uh, so we really try to just make it as doable as possible um, for all the adults that are involved. And, and over the years, just based on the feedback that we've received, uh, we've um, kind of made it as easy as possible, just having each week we send out an e-blast, um, which has the things listed, um, and also the programs that are relevant uh, to the 21 things um, aspect of the tech series. So if you go on our website, uh, you can actually see the 21 things um, website that we have within Darien Library. So this will just show you some of the weeks and topics. And if you can click on them, uh, it'll show you just the little write-ups that we do. This week we're doing ebooks and devices. Uh, just some of what the things actually are um, and some of the programs uh, that within the tech series can kind of be one of the things by attending that the parents can, can complete. So two of our most successful programs for parents uh, are the app chats and tweet ups. Uh, the app chats are kind of taken from the reader's advisory programs that we do within the library as a whole. Each week we have a Meet Us on Main Street program where librarians highlight some new books um, as well as other materials like DVDs, uh, magazines, uh, to our patrons. Uh, so we really kind of wanted to take that format and have that available for parents. Um, so as you can see there, that's on a weekday. Uh, we just had a group of parents just sitting around, and, and a lot of times we, we just will highlight based on subject. Um, so sometimes it could be um, homework apps, um, also, for adults, sometimes we just take what their interests are, like travel, um, and just kind of educate them on, on how to select good apps, as well as just new apps that, that we're learning about and, and kind of want to test drive. So also we have had programs where we take a lot of parents who we see are active on Twitter. Um, and one time we offered a Twitter Moms program where we had a panel of parents just talking about how they use Twitter, um, whether it was to promote their business or just to connect with other um, families within the town, um, and just to communicate various things that were going on within Darien, um, and just to kind of have parents uh, as involved as possible um, to bring the community in and actually um, help us run some of the programs. So just to show you some best practices, things that pretty much have worked well for us over the past few years, um, one is to give your staff opportunities to test drive new technologies. Um, so every other month we offer here in the library just an example of what you can do. Um, we have a Tech Bytes program, which uh, every other month focuses on a different topic. So it could be 3D printing one month. Um, it could be something like how to use Microsoft Office another, another month. Um, and just we invite all our staff, including part-timers, um, interns, just to come in. And most of them are staff-led. Um, so we just kind of teach our staff the ins and outs of uh, new technologies or just some technology that they might have been using for years and might not necessarily know all the offerings that it has. We also like to offer a diverse programming, and again, as I mentioned, kind of looking at, um, at what programs and what age groups you're providing those programs for, um, to see if there are any holes, um, to see if you're kind of mostly focusing on preschoolers um, and kind of leaving out that six to eight age range. Um, so it's just really important to make sure you're hitting um, all those target audiences. And again, as I said, uh, just bringing in the community to help you lead programs. Um, so we kind of like to mix um, having our librarians lead programs, um, also having guest instructors coming in. We have one mom who has her own business and, and really uses Etsy a lot. 
Uh, so she has an Etsy shop and each year has been coming in to teach an Etsy 101 program for us. Um, we've also just had uh, one uh, nice example is, is taking a high schooler who came and did a little intro to coding program for us, um, just kind of as, as a tutor for kids, uh, which was really great. And, and just seeing um, within the community both what kids and adults, um, what their interests are and, and how they can help instruct um, other, other members of their community. Also offering incentives is good, especially we found over the years um, parents just as much as their kids love prizes. So what we've had, uh, if a parent or anyone participating in the 21 Things program, uh, even if they complete one of the things per week, they automatically get entered into a thematic raffle each week, uh, which is really fun. This past week, it was Makers um, was our focus, so we gave them a subscription to Maker Magazine. Also evaluating your program. Um, we're kind of, I think the first two years, we, we sent out surveys to all the participants. Uh, first, all, we're not completely a survey-heavy survey, survey heavy library. Um, a lot of times, since we know a lot of our community members, we just kind of have informal conversations with them. Uh, you know, oh, did you complete the program? Um, you know, why, you know, if not, why not? Um, what do, you, do you have any suggestions of how we can make it a little easier and more fun? So really, we just kind of um, just take those opportunities to kind of engage uh, members within the community just to, to kind of see what their thoughts are, since it is their library. So how to implement, um, if you're thinking about offering some of these services and programs uh, into your libraries. Um, the first one, advocate. Um, so definitely discuss with your administration. Um, try to, to do um, some research and communicate how important um, offering tech services is, um, especially to children. You know, the studies, um, show them what other libraries have been doing. Uh, you can also start small. Um, offer a few programs here, here and there. If you're not able to offer a whole series, uh, just start out with, with one program, um, possibly a, a preschooler program that you can put in with your other story time sessions. Um, just engage interest, too. Uh, just see what your community's needs are and, and what their interests are. Also, to research what other libraries are doing. Um, participate in, in tweet-ups um, that are sponsored through ASK. Um, you can always reach out to other librarians. Uh, we always get a lot of inquiries uh, from librarians who are applying for grants now um, to try to get these technologies into the hands of kids. Uh, so, but always please make sure to make it your own. Um, each, as I said at the during the introduction, each library um, we have different populations that we serve. So it's something that works for us might not necessarily uh, work for your organization. And also experiment. Um, the first, year, first two years actually we didn't have iPads and what I did was I started to use my own iPad uh, just in story time, um, specifically the bilingual story time. And just kind of have, you know, even if kids are hanging out around the children's room, just have them use your own. I mean, for book groups, we tended to do that and, and just kind of gave us a sense of whether kids uh, really would use these new technologies within programs. Um, so yeah, just try out new things. We're never scared of, I mean, we have ideas and we just turn it into a program um, and just try it out. Sometimes they fail, um, but most of the times uh, we're just really pleasantly surprised by, by how successful they are. So thank you. I'll use this time um, to answer any more questions that you might have. Um, if you don't have an opportunity, um, let me just flip through. Uh, feel free to always email uh, or call us at the library. Um, we'd love to answer your questions, uh, anything that we can be helpful with. Um, also, I mentioned that we're in the midst of our tech series right now. So if you want to go and check uh, on the kids section of Darien Library's website, 
Uh, we have the digital family post, which links you to some of the kids programs that we're doing. Um, in addition to the 21 Things website, uh, and also um, we're starting to offer a lot of family programs together this year. So uh, we're trying to do a digital storytelling program uh, with kids and their grown-ups, and we're going to end the tech series with a big uh, digital scavenger hunt for families, which should be really fun. Excellent. Great ideas, Claire. Um, as she said, if you have uh, a question for her, we've had some throughout, which is great. Um, feel free to use your question box for that. We do have a, a little bit of time um, to answer some questions. Um, one that came through is, uh, how many iPads have you purchased uh, for teens, adults, um, kids, that sort of thing? Do you, do you know offhand? Um, so in our room, we started out with uh, the six iPads for, um, to put within the early literacy kit. Uh, then in addition to that, the next year, so we've kind of built it year by year. Um, so in addition to that, we did six programming iPads. So these are iPads that we specifically use for programs. Um, and then in addition to that, we have the two that are in the room currently that are mounted on the walls. Um, but for adults, uh, and so not in the children's department, uh, we're doing a collaboration with MoMA, um, Museum of Modern Art in New York, and what the adults decided to do is they now have four iPads that are circulating uh, which have art apps on them and also access to some of the MoMA um, ebooks. Do you tether the iPads that were not wall mounted? No, uh, so they're locked up in the tea room. So do you mean the programming iPads? Typically right. Only bring them out uh, for programs. Okay. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so, uh, someone else asked, "What is your annual budget for all of this, and how how do you pay for the the iPads? Do you get uh, donations? Is it something your your city helps invest in?" I'm I'm. That's always kind of the million dollar question. Is a lot of this stuff sounds awesome, and we just don't have a way to pay for it. So. I don't know, maybe there um, are some ways to do that that we haven't yeah, thought of. So, so for our funding structure, uh, what all our collections and programs and the technology budget uh, comes from the annual campaign. Uh, so it's fundraised. So, so not um, what comes from the town is mainly um, just keeping the library itself running as well as uh, having staff. Um, but this is all fundraised, but it, it's kind of, all together within the library's technology budget. So each year as the children's library, we kind of have to meet uh, with our assistant director and still very much advocate for what we want to do with a portion of the budget. Um, so that's kind of why some years we've only, you know, we started out with the early literacy kits, um, and that's pretty much, you know, all we could do for that year. As you've had parents and more families come in, have they been willing you know, to contribute monetarily or volunteer, or so have you noticed, um, you know, just sort of building more of that community as the programs have increased? We do have um, parents, because we, I mean, we know a lot of the families really well, um, and a lot of the kids who participate in these programs uh, do it year in and year out. Um, so we have had parents who've talked to us about, you know, is there anything that we can donate? Um, to the children's library specifically, uh, so we've you know we've kind of thought about things and objects, especially with the launching of the tea room. Okay. But um, after giving this presentation, I, I have had a lot of librarians who who have said that they've um, successfully applied for grants. Oh, great! Um, and received them, yeah. Great. Um, do you have a a link to the app list that you use, or is that you said that is on? Um, your page, your, your website, or? Yes, it is found on the library's website. So if you go to the kids section, uh, on the left, left side, um, there should be a section for um, apps and tech. OK, thank you. That was a question that came through. Um, Claire, I'm kind of throwing this, out, this question out to everyone, but um, so what would you consider your, your dream library to be? 
or uh, your dream children's section, or what do you think that would look like? <laughs> well, I I would have loved um, if our I mean, we kind of had to work with the space that we were given. So, I mean, I would love if the maker space that we have would be a little bit a little bit bigger, um, just because we're limited to how many kids can fit in there at one time. But I think I think last night we had about twelve kids as well as adults. Um, so just kind of, I mean, I would love to kind of build up that room, um, just purchase more technology that kids can get their hands on. Excellent. All right, that is all the time we have for your session. Um, thank you so much, Claire, uh, for all of your great ideas. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for listening in. Um, hopefully, you'll be joining in for future presentations. And uh, our next session is up at 1 p.m. We have Nate Hill and Justin Henke at the Chattanooga Public Library that will be uh, presenting for us. So if you're ending today, um, so long. Otherwise, we will talk to all of you this afternoon. Thank you. Yes, thank you.